Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I had just recently tried to do a broadcast with regards to this important post that I had put up recently, but there was no sound. But here we are trying again, and hopefully this time you can hear me. So this is now about where are the autopsy reports for COVID-19 vaccine booster deaths? What am I talking about when I speak about that? Well, this is largely because we have probably one of the biggest trials going on in the context of uh, COVID-19 with Israel. Because Israel have just started within the past month delivering booster doses for its population because there's been a significant change with regards to uh, COVID-19 deaths and hospitalizations. So this is an important stage as we try and think about really how do we move forward for the pandemic. So here is the question that I asked on LinkedIn. And so what I'm doing for you guys on YouTube and Facebook is I'm sharing with you some of the discussions that I'm having on LinkedIn with some other professionals. So here we have the point about, I stated there is a lack of scientific rigor for this critical stage of the pandemic, as we presume that the worst is behind. Detailed analysis of serum and tissue for severe COVID-19 and death has not been published. Where is this critical data located? So I was making reference to Israel recently publishing data on the reduction of severe COVID-19 using vaccine booster doses. However, that paper did not mention any significant adverse effects or the number of patients dying within, say, 14 days of the booster dose. So I was asking for the statisticians. If we have given 1.2 million booster doses and we've had a reduction of 298 severe cases, that means in the group there were 330 versus 32. So you can see the, finger, uh, the, the, the numbers here. What you've got is that you have got here um, 3,000 um, patients with confirmed infections, uh, um, confirmed, confirmed infections 3,000, severe COVID-19 330. And this is in the group that is only had the second dose. They've not had the booster dose. So they're looking at 4 million person days at risk. When you compared it to 12 days beyond the third booster dose, so this one is over 3 million person days at risk, they have found that there were 313 confirmed infections and 32 cases of severe COVID-19. So this is a significant reduction in terms of risk of severe disease. But in real terms, this was over 1.2 million doses that were given. In real terms, it means that we saved 298 people from severe COVID-19. That's wonderful. And that is exactly what we would hope would happen with regards to a booster dose. However, what it doesn't tell us is what is the risk for adverse events in that group. And that's the bit that I was trying to clarify. And so when we look at the discussion that I was having on LinkedIn, here are some of the points that were raised. For one, it had 149 um, reactions to it. We've had over 4,000 views of this post. And I'd made the link to the paper that I was making reference to. Um, one of the responses was from Professor Goldstein. Now, I have great respect for Professor Goldstein because he is such a detailed with regards to data. However, as he's pointed out, good question as always, Philip. No published data yet, as this effort is quite recent. What we do have is a surgery of third booster recipients. Only 1% sought medical attention and over 80% the shot was same or less uncomfortable than the second one. That's in a sense good news, but it doesn't answer our question. Because if we're seeing a 1% 
um, adverse effect or medical attention, that means out of 1.2 million people, 1,200 people could have had either minor, medium, or severe adverse effects, and we have not at all discussed death. So in the context of the details, this was the question. If we have saved 298 patients, what number would it take for this to no longer be a clear benefit? And that's the question that we need to answer. Um, somebody else, this is Craig, was saying the whole lack of scientific rigor around the response to COVID-19 has been alarming. And it has largely been driven by fear and opportunity. Thanks for the post, representing a measured interpretation. And you have to remember that in the context of um, the approach that we're doing to, to, to vaccination is that largely the perception is that we have very low risk to significant events with regards to vaccination. Now, it takes time for this kind of details to be sought out. And usually what we're trying to find, and especially with regards to my work with regards to autoimmunity and COVID-19, I am particularly concerned about thromboembolic events. That's things like heart attacks, strokes, clots on the lungs and clots in the legs. Because based on the autoimmune principle with regards to serum ACE2, I would think that there's a higher risk of potential clots forming, which can then cause this kind of response. And this is why I'm very interested in terms of the risk benefit with regards to booster doses. Um, here is another point that was made by Prakash. If possible, all deaths must go through some test or autopsy. Maybe a program to um, use a robot to take a look inside, record um, it may be some kind of tissues for further evaluation. But as he said, not doing any test or autopsy is like shutting our eyes when in big trouble. And that's a very valid point. The point is, is that we have not done enough detailed research with regards to tissue and serum for us to be absolutely clear that everything is working properly. And this is something that we must, absolutely must do at this stage of the pandemic. Here's another point. Set the criteria before and evaluate, then take the correct course of action. Right now we're changing the criteria to meet the goal. None of this makes any sense. Yes, I had to probably agree with that. We certainly can't do that and not therefore end up doing the right thing just because we didn't look um, well enough. Uh, thank you there, um, Abby. And um, I'm just sharing out uh, for Infinity 8, uh, keeping the truth going. It's more than keeping the truth going. It's more like keeping the science going. So we really appreciate these um, shout outs from people. Before I finish, I'll just look at a few more comments that were made. Um, this is an interesting one from Denny. Sadly, how many aren't even documented? She's talking about adverse events and deaths, such as my aunt. The people at greatest risk of death also have other issues. Any heart attack should require autopsy and analysis of serum and tissue. 14 days, how about 120 days? The lifespan of RBCs has exact affinity for ACE2 or spike. This is right along the line that I was talking about from Denny. I think it's an important point. Just to put it in context for um, people, is you have to remember that if somebody has a heart attack and they have already got quite a number of comorbidities, it's very difficult to differentiate if this could have been related to say a booster dose or if this was just because they happened to have a heart attack around the time. However, when we're looking at the research, what we need to do is not make any assumptions. We just look at the big numbers and we see how far this would deviate from the normal. And that's how we would be able to better determine whether or not something is relevant. And so when we come to the point, as I flag this again, you had severe COVID-19 was among this group of confirmed infections. Of the 3,330 had severe COVID-19. The percentages are about the same with the boosters. It's still about 10%, which is 32 from 313. 
But overall, for the 1.2 million doses given, 330 from 32 gives you 298 severe cases of COVID-19 that were reduced. So that is very important and that is significant. However, we still need to balance the adverse events, significant adverse events and death with regards to these kinds of numbers. And that's where we have to look in order for us to have a much clearer idea as what to what we're doing. Uh, here you have an, a, a pretty good chart with regards to the days from the, the booster dose and vaccination. This is from day 12 onwards. So in Israel, they have been the melting pot and we really appreciate their research. We appreciate what they have done because it helps us to be able to find better answers and better solutions in this pandemic. Wonderful. Well, um, as we come to the end here, uh, thank you very much, Infinity8, um, about, well, we're talking about uh, clots um, in, in the blood, which is true. These are things that we have to look out for. Thank you all very much. And just remember that what we are doing here is we are trying to focus on the science. We want to know what is best what is relevant and how to make the best decisions for all the countries across the world during this COVID-19 pandemic. Stay tuned for no more broadcasts. I'm going to be trying to do more of these posts that I've done on LinkedIn and sharing some of the thoughts and the responses as it will help you to understand a bit more about the discussions that are ongoing um, across the world. Have a great evening.